Well, good morning. And welcome to the worship of God. Preparation for worship this morning comes from J.I. Packer. We're going to be thinking about what it means to, to know God as we think about the, the revamped vision statement. And this is what Packer had to say. And I want you to think about your own life here, because that, of course, is the, the only life you, you're living. Once you become aware that the main business that you are here for, meaning alive, is to know God, most of life's problems fall into place of their own accord. What, he, what he's saying is, once you figure out that why you exist is to know God and be known by God, most of the big stuff just falls into place. There'll be little questions, but the big stuff's figured out. So I hope you got that big stuff figured out. And we'll hear about that this morning. Cultship is thinking about knowing God. It's Jesus' word to the, the Samaritan woman, saying, you Samaritans worship what you don't know, but we worship what we do know. A time is coming now when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth because these are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. So what Jesus is saying is we know God, and we want the Samaritans to know God. And that's what we, as a church, we know God, we want others to know God. And we're going to be praising him together, singing one verse or one time through of Bless the Lord, O My Soul. Father, as we, we just sang, we ask that we would be, have hearts that would desire to bless you above all. And when that's the case, everything else does kind of fall of its own accord into place. Your son saying, seek ye first my kingdom and my righteousness and all that's needful will be given. But we ask that for each of us this morning, we might be reoriented toward you. And that's the, that's the happy life. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. And this God who invites you to, to know him, he welcomes you with these words. May grace be yours, and may God's mercy be yours. May his peace rest upon you. And this comes from the God who is, and the God who was, and the God who is to come. And all of God's people said, amen. And as God's welcomed us, let's welcome one another. We're going to continue singing, thinking about the, the joy of knowing God as the deer.
And please be seated. I'm going to be reading from Psalm 32, thinking about confessing our sin and being assured that we're forgiven. Happy is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Happy is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against him, and in whose spirit is no deceit. So the sense of laying it all bare before God and saying, change me, forgive me, that's the one who's happy. But when I kept silent about this, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. Maybe you have that experience. I often do, or my conscience is just working on me, and I need to just take it before God, which is what David does. Then I acknowledge my sin to you. And I didn't cover it up. I said, I'll confess my transgression to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. We're going to be singing about that forgiving of guilt of the sin as we, even though the title says, I stand amazed, we're going to sit amazed as we we praise God, singing together three verses. going to be um, reading from John 6. This is the, the obedience of holy living. What does God expect of, of you? What does God expect of, of everybody? John 6, 25 to 29. This is the, the work that God requires. This is them on the other, Jesus on the other side of the lake. The crowds find him. And they said, when they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? And Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, you're looking for me not because you saw miraculous signs, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Don't work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. On him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Then they asked him, what must we do to do the works God requires? Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. To believe in the one he sent. We saw last week, thinking with uh, studying Jeremiah, that the belief that this is what's on the inside, and on the outside is, is action, and thinking about, about that. Um, ask that the children would please come, come forward for children and 
Sorry, children's message. I'm sorry, children of worship is tonight. I don't know when I am right now. All right, and Bethany, wherever Bethany is, you're going to want to get a microphone for when you come up here to talk, my love. All right, we'll take a seat here. Jonathan, Daddy, we'll talk, buddy. All right, now we'll start with an easy one. Can anybody tell me what this is? A cow. A cow. And who made cows? Jesus. Jesus, God, right. Okay, what about, what about this? A duck. A, a, du a duck or a goose, depending. All right. A goosey. And who, now who made this? Dakota, who made this? God. And now what about this? What's, and who made this one? Okay, and... And what's this? All right, what sound does, what sound does this make? Oink. Now, do, if we have any pig farmers, I want you to kind of think about how accurate this sound is, all right? Yeah, well, you know, you know what's going on. So, now, what about this? Who is, what is this right here? The, a tiger. But now, what about this right here? What is this? This is Charlotte. And now, who made little girls? God. Who made little boys? And, no, God made everything. And that's what you're thinking about if you're in Sunday school. Right now you're thinking about God made everything, and God made you. And as we think about that, we want you to be learning that there and also remembering here that we think about, too, that God made everything. So what you do in Sunday school connects with what we do in here in the sanctuary. And also songs that you're going to sing. If you go to singing, today you're going to sing a song all about creation and that God made everything. So Bethany, where are you? Hi guys. Hi guys. So for kids choir, we are not going to meet in the sanctuary. The kids <coughs> choir is going to go d down that hallway and then just past the kitchen there's that big youth room, the one that has the couches. And so after the worship service, if you're in preschool through 4th grade, then you guys can head down that way. And there's chairs and there's signs that say which grade sits in which row. Okay? And the kids' choir is also, if any of you ever have grandkids coming or if you kids have cousins or friends visiting, um, they're more than welcome to join us for kids' choir. It just meets until um, the official start of the Sunday school hour. So from the end of the service until 11 o'clock. Um, also, you kids will be getting your juice in, you know there's that little window in the youth room that goes through to the kitchen? That's where you'll get your juice. So anybody who's serving juice this year, if you could set the kids' juice cups in that little window to the youth room. Thank you. All right. And let's close our eyes, and I'll have to collect all my animals back in a second. I don't want to go away from mom. Shh. We're going to pray, buddy. And Father, that you created us and that you created all things and you created them for us to enjoy. And we know that you made us very, very good and you said that about us, that you looked at what you had made and you said this is very, very good. And we ask that each of these kids would remember that and us adults as well would remember that we're made in your image. And so we've got dignity and we're loved. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, and you can go in peace, unless I've got any animals here. Thank you very, very much. Jonathan? You've got to be very careful with a lot of farmers when you make animal noises. That's, that's what I've learned. Land speed record right there. Um, going to be going to our God in prayer. Um, first.
couple announcements. We're hoping choir would be able to start today, but Paula Van Bakov has got COVID. So we're going to start on October 3 once she's able to be out of quarantine. Um, good reminder to keep praying for people who have COVID or people who are vulnerable for, for COVID. Um, sometimes it's when the news so much you just kind of get immune to it. But people we care about and love suffering from it. And then um, maybe you notice posters about depression on the way into the, the sanctuary. You've got flyers in your box as well. I'm on the, the Tri-State Bible Conference board and we brought in a speaker about depression because mental health concerns and difficulties are, are, are through the, the roof. And this is a way of saying, how can we bring God's word to bear on this, this topic? So please, please check that out. It's October 7 and 8. Let's go together to our God in prayer. Father, your psalmist prayed to you with praise, saying, praise the Lord. I will extol the Lord with all my heart in the counsel of the upright and the assembly. Great are the works of the Lord. They're pondered by all who delight in them. And we just thought about that with the kids. Great are these works. Great are these little children. Great are we made in your image. And we are in that assembly, those who ponder your works. And some of us have particular works in mind. We praise you for them. Some of us have received wonderful news this past week. We've seen your faithfulness. We've experienced unexpected kindnesses. We're here to praise you in delight. Others of us are here remembering your past deeds of kindness because we're currently in turmoil. We say with the, the psalmist, not with a smile, but with hope, he has caused his wonders to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. He provides food for those who fear him. He remembers his covenant forever. And sometimes we, we need reminders that you've been there for your people in the past, that you've promised you will in the future, and that means you're there for your people right now in the midst of what we're in. And the psalm ends with the words, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All who follow his precepts have good understanding. To him be eternal praise. That's a good word for us this week as we got quite a bit of wisdom coming our, our way, different ministries starting back up. We think about GEMS, Cadets, and The Edge. We will be with, with older Christians, we'll be with younger Christians. We've all got wisdom to gain, we've all got wisdom to offer. And we ask that as a result of this year, what that last verse says might be what's in our hearts to him be eternal praise that we might be excited by what it is that you do what you do through these ministries that you do in our lives and we pray that as well as circle of faith starts up and choir and children's choir and for children in worship as it started up last week and sunday school and catechism and, and other ministries as well and father we're in a, a new season and seasons are gifts from you. It's a reminder that there's, there's change. There's nice things about having a break in the summer. There's nice things about heading back into our regular routines too. And we ask that you might establish the work of the hands of these ministries and bless them. Bless all those who, who lead. And bless all those who learn. And we pray for, as well as we think about these change of, of seasons, we're mindful of the favorable weather we've been receiving. There was tractors and combines and trucks all over the place yesterday, and that's a reason for Thanksgiving. We're exercising our, our dominion over the earth for the good of others and of ourselves. And Father, we have many reasons for Thanksgiving in this regard, particularly as we think back to our deep concerns about drought throughout the year. And you're teaching us to depend upon you, and that's hard. Help us to, to continue to learn. And we pray for Paula Van Bakov as she's got COVID right now. Pray for other loved ones we have who are quarantined or still recovering. For some, it's a very lengthy process. And Father, we pray for others who are facing the possibility of new mandates or restrictions for nursing homes and others. This causes a whole lot of questions and work behind the scenes trying to figure out different contingencies. And this can be exhausting for people who are already quite exhausted. 
And we pray for Harlan Adama and Lee Blankespoor as they battle against cancer. Encourage these men. It's been a it's been a long road. It's been a long road for for Hoop as we think about the, the past number of years having gone through it before, and we ask that you'd heal him again. And Father, it's been although not as as long of a road for for Lee in regards to the time since knowing the the diagnosis or first dealing with cancer, but long time in the hospital for Lee with the the leukemia treatments and just getting done with another five-day regimen and having another one coming up in October. Father, that seems to be a dominating factor in his year, but you're more dominant still. We ask that you would continue to give him the trust that, that he needs that we would all need in that situation. And we rejoice for another year of life for Jean Landigan. We thank you for the improvement that we've seen in her over the past year, and we ask for another good year. And Father, we pray for wisdom for the deacons, the elders, and the council as we meet tomorrow for classes on Tuesday. The psalm says, The works of your hands are faithful and just. All your precepts are trustworthy. You've established them forever, and you've enacted faithfulness and uprightness. And Father, we as elders and deacons and counsel, Father, we are dealing with what's faithful and just and trustworthy and holy and, and awesome. And Father, we pray that for the, the churches of this community as well as they're worshiping you right now. Keep us all mindful of your faithfulness to us, your trustworthiness, Father, how awesome you are. And may we all grow in the knowledge of you and play our role in this community and world. That's what we need. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you would please stand with me and turn in your Bibles to, to Psalm 17, verse 3. So, I'm sorry, John 17, verse 3. Both John and Psalms are good, so... Sorry, I, I put some. I don't, I don't think I let the the ushers know about the scripture sheets, so I'm I'm sorry. We'll have those for you next week. Psalm 17. I'm just going to read verse three. Um, now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. It's our first in a three-week series thinking about revamp mission statement. And what Jesus seems to think eternal life is, is knowing God and knowing him. And that's what we as God's people do. Let's go to prayer. Father, I ask that you would give me what I I need to, to speak this word to your people in a way that's helpful to them, helpful to us as a church. So we think about the difficulties and the culture and the church in this this country now and over the last couple generations and particularly in the last year and a half father we ask that we might recognize the, the life that we're able to live and we might know you we might know your son we might recognize that this is what life is is about and what makes everything else about life good and we ask this in your son's name amen Please be seated. The pandemic has been remarkably, remarkably difficult for churches in this country. In many ways, it's sucked the, the life out of, out of what was happening. Scott McConnell, he's the executive director of Lifeway Research, Thinking about this past year and a half, he said, that's a lot of momentum to lose. And that's a lot of people stepping out of the habit of weekly worship. It's been a really hard couple of years for churches. Estimates vary about what, what, what is the church going to look like and people returning from before COVID to, to after COVID. It's like nothing at least anybody I know has ever seen before. And on top of that, then you get differences of opinions about matters like vaccines and masks. I'm not sure about your own family, but 
Sometimes those disagreements aren't always so, so agreeable. So you get relationships that are strained. And then there's been disagreements about politics. Um, there are CRC churches that have had splits. There are CRC churches that their pastors and the churches have gone in different directions because things got just so politically cantankerous. One of them made the, the LA, LA Times. So those tensions are, are high. As I mentioned before, counselors, you, you, it's, it's hard to get in to see a mental health counselor because there's so much anxiety right now. And when anxiety builds up, it, it eventually blows in, in different ways. I, mean, I found myself blowing in, in different ways with people, my kids, just a very high stress time. It's got nothing to do with what that person, like what this child actually did, but there's just so much going on. So close relationships are, are strained, more distant relationships are even, even more strained. HR experts are talking about a, a tsunami of change coming of people switching jobs because it's just so stressful for them and the job they've got. Misunderstandings abound in the, the workplace. There's a lot of anxiety right now. A lot of anxiety in churches. A lot of anxiety in pretty much most churches. So it's a providential time to be thinking about this, this vision statement, not because it's a simple one, two, three answer of, well, okay, we do that and that, that, that makes everything right, but it simply reminds us, what has it always been about to follow God? What has it always been about to be part of a church? And sometimes we need those reminders. This week, the next week, and the next week, we're going to be looking at uh, the revamped vision statement. Essentially, it takes the elements of the, the previ previous vision statement and kind of boils it down to an easily memorizable one. And today, we're going to think about knowing God. That, that's what's most needed. Thinking about what's happened the last year and a half, be still and know that I am God. You think about crisis you've been through the book of Job. What does God do? He doesn't give him any answers because that's not really going to help Job. He says, question after question after question, essentially to say, be still and know that I'm God. So first we're going to think about knowing God because that's what's most needful and that's what churches do. We know God. It's a bizarre claim. You can go to somebody you talk to tomorrow and say, well, yeah, yesterday I heard from God. I know God. I can open this book and know him. And second, how we are and how we can, meaning we're already doing this as a church, we're already doing this as Christians, but sometimes we need to be reminded, here's, here's what really matters and you're already doing it. And it's going to even be better for you if you do it more. Well, first, knowing God. Second, how we are, how we can. First is knowing God. The most notable thing about God's people throughout human history has always been that they know God. All right, it, it, it's not that their affluence, it's not their cultural savvy, it's not their particular, even always particular life changes going on in them because I, my sanctification's horribly slow. The key thing about God's people has always been we know God. And we're known by God. And both of those are wonderful. I remember back then we got some young people that are, are starting college. And all the friends that you had in high school, you're not by anymore. And it feels wonderful when somebody, when you know them well enough that you actually know them and you know that they know you and they care that you're you, that's a wonderful feeling. And thinking about God, that, that's part of knowing God. You're known by him and you know him. Both of them. This is the first, you see this in the first interaction between Moses, who wrote the first five books of the Bible, and God. So in some ways, this is actually the, the first, first person experience of somebody meeting with God, because Moses wrote Genesis. And, but when he met God was that burning bush. And the first thing he knows about God is that God knows him, Moses. Moses. Meaning, I, I know you. 
I've been with you this whole time. I, I know what's going on, bud. And then he introduces himself to say, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he introduces himself that way because he's relational. He doesn't say, Moses, Moses, I'm the holy God. Moses, Moses, I'm the one who made everything. He says, Moses, Moses, I'm the friend of these people. It could also be not just God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It would be God of Adam, God of Lanny, God of Megan. That, that's, that's what he's saying is I'm this relational God. That's how you know me. Pascal, um, he was a brilliant mathematician. People still use some of his theorems. But he had this experience one night that he just this, he couldn't even really describe it. But he wrote it down in a journal afterwards and he sewed it to the inside of his jacket so it would always be with him. And it starts off by saying, fire, fire, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, not of philosophers. Not that he's against philosophy because he's a pretty well-known philosopher. But he's saying is, it's not just ideas, it's this actual relationship. He actually knows me and I know him. That's what he's saying. And he carried it with him right by his heart all the time to remember that until he died. Carl Henry saw the, the same. Speaking about his own conversion, this is what he, he wrote. Into the darkness of my young life, maybe we got somebody here that feels like their life is total darkness. Into the darkness of my young life, Henry writes, God put bright stars that still shine and sparkle after that encounter with God, I walked the world with God as my friend. That's what God's after with you. God as your friend. You as God's friend. All right, we tend to think of ourselves as God's servants, and that's part of it. But the main thing is he's after is that this relationship. The best thing you know about Abraham is he's called God's friend. And what does Jesus say? To his disciples before he's crucified. I don't call you servants anymore, I call you friends. Meaning I've totally opened myself up to you. And you're open yourselves up to me. That, that's what it's about. Now you know God and you know him through his word. This is where he tells you about himself. This is how you know him. Like if you were to know me, we would go out, I don't know, we get coffee, we would we would I don't know, go for a run. I got no, no idea exactly what we would, would do there, but we would get to know each other as we did things. And the people I know best is the people that you just kind of rub shoulders with the most. That's how it works. But with God, the way you get to know him is you, you can't take him out for coffee, but he tells you all about himself in this word. This is a, God, this is a word from God about God. It's not primarily about how you can be good. It's really saying God's, it's almost his autobiography of saying, let, let me open myself up to you. This is what I'm like. Do you want to know me? And if you know him, that will change you to become more like him. Don't conform anymore to the pattern of this world, Paul says, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, meaning you spend time with God and, and you're transformed. You become more like him. You become like what you think about. Now, you can know God comprehensively through this book. My grandmother was a prolific letter writer. Maybe some of you grandmas are. If you are, keep it up. You might not get a whole lot of, whole lot of feedback now, but my grandma, I still have letters from her. I've got an envelope on my, in my office. You can see it if you, if you want. little love note, and then she's got little notes written. Um, she, again, prolific, so I, I would get New Year's Day letters. I would get Valentine's Day letters from my grandma. I would get St. Patrick's Day letters from my grandma. I would get April Fool's Day letters from my grandma. I once got a March of Dimes Day letter from my grandmother. I don't even know that was a thing, but apparently she found it. So tons of letters. But if you read all those letters, you wouldn't really know my grandma all that well. You would know that she loved her, her grandson. You would know that they had over the, the Tuchelises last night before she wrote that letter. But you wouldn't know her comprehensively. You couldn't say much about Pearl Dean from reading those letters because it's just a small sliver of her life that she saw fit to share with her grandson. But now you can know God comprehensively by reading this book because what it is, it's him and 
with people just like you in hundreds and hundreds of different situations. So when the chips are down, what is God like with people? That's what's going on with, with this book, Psalm 103. He made known his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. So you know that God loves order because you look at creation, talk about that with the kids. Or you know that God loves that and therefore, when there's things that are in disorder in your life and it seems wrong, you, you got that right. It's not the way it's supposed to be. God made it better, and he's going to make it better. Or you, you read about the wilderness, and you recognize that God really loves gratitude. But he responds to, to grumbling pretty much the way that parents do with their, their little kids in the back of the van. You know he's exceedingly merciful to anybody who will repent because you see that on pretty much every page. This is to say, okay, what, God, what is God like? Because everybody has thoughts about God. Everybody, everybody does. Jim Carrey thinks all sorts of thoughts about God. Anybody you can think of. But this is the only place you actually know, are these thoughts valid? Are these actually what God is like? Because if it's not what God is like, the relationship's going to be really wonky. I mean, just like, okay, let's say I've got a misunderstanding with my wife and I've got a bee in my bonnet about something and I really think that she's kind of got it out for me and I'm misinterpreting everything that's going on with her. The relationship's not going to go well because I don't actually know her for who he is. She is. I've got to kind of sit her down. We've got to talk about these, these things. And here's where God sits you down and he says, let me show you what I'm like. And it, I hope you know this and I get this. I wish I got it more. When you're surprised by who Jesus is, that's when you get the sense that, okay, I thought I had him figured out, but I don't. That's most of the Christian experience. When you are with God, it's, oh man, he's far better than I thought he was. He's far more merciful than I thought he was. He's far more interested in changing me than I thought he was. So you're surprised by him. But you're only going to be surprised by him if you let him tell, tell you about himself. So that's why if you're, you're bored with God, you're bored with an idea. You're not bored with a person. That's why when I'm bored with God, and I get that, it's an occupational hazard for pastors, it's like, okay, I'm just thinking about ideas now. I'm not thinking about God. I'm not thinking about somebody who loves me anymore. I'm just saying, okay, I've got to get through Jeremiah. I've got to get through my daily reading. I, mean, I know what that's like, you know what that's like, but that's not the relationship that you want. So you know him in his word, and you also know him in his son. No one's ever seen God, John said, Jesus' close disciple, his friend. No one's ever seen God, but the son, the one and only, who's in close relationship with the father, he's made him known. Or Hebrews 1 says the, the son is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being. So the idea here is, okay, what would God be like if God moved to Elverd? That's essentially the incarnation. Let's say God moved to Elverd. What would he be like? How would he farm? What would he do? How would he treat people? What would he be into? That, that's the incarnation. And so you watch Jesus. You watch him deal with people who society excludes. Say, say the Roman occupiers. How does Jesus deal with the centurions he runs into? How does he deal with the tax collectors who are, are fleecing their own people for Rome? How does he deal with people like Herod who are, are just trying to use him? How does he deal with people who really just don't want to see what he keeps putting in front of their eyes like the rich young ruler? Experience, relationship after relationship after relationship to say, okay, I know him. I understand him. How do I need to change? How can I change? And now knowing God, this, this is the deepest need anybody's got. Uh, we were in Minneapolis for a wedding this weekend. And on the way back, maybe you, maybe you know this, I, I don't know what, I think it was 494, but they had this tower that at least 40 feet high, and then there was a car on top of it. And then Psalm 46, verse 10, which, be still and know that I'm God. 
I'm not sure if the idea is like, okay, if you're in this car, you be still and know that, that I'm God. I, I don't know why that was connected, but it's a good reminder because that's a well-loved verse because that's often what you find yourself telling yourself, right? After you get done freaking out about a situation, okay, be still. God's God. And that's, that's the whole book of Job. 30 chapters of really intense discussions and disagreements between Job and his friend of why is your life totally going to pot, Job? And at the end of it, God comes and asks him question after question after question. The logic of it is saying, I'm God. That's why he talks about all those animals, why he created all these things. He's saying, I got this. I got your life. You just be still and know that I'm God. And if you find yourself, and we all do at times, I'm saying, well, why didn't you do this then? Then you're actually having the conversation with God that you need to have. And that's what God's after with Job. Essentially, he says you've been, to Job, you've been talking with your friends uh, about me, but now talk to me. Because that's, that's what's needful for Job in that moment is to take it right to God. Say, God, help me. God, I'm so ticked off that now all my kids are dead. That's the Psalms. You just take it right to God because you know him. That's what he wants. He wants that relationship with you. And this is why Jesus came. This is, he says, I've come that they might have life and have it to the full. And then he says, here's what life is. It's to know you, as in to know God and to know Jesus whom you sent. That that's what life is. That's eternal life. So which means is if you have that, you are already living eternal life. We tend to think about eternal life starting after you die. But Jesus' view is actually eternal life is now. If you know God, you are in eternal life already. So your coming to faith is actually a much bigger day for you than the day that you're going to die. That's the bigger transition. So if you know God, you don't need to be near as afraid of death because it's not going to be near as big of a transition as you think it is. Because you already know God. You've already got the main thing. You've already got eternal life. You're already in it. This is why Jesus said, even though he dies, yet he will live. But Jesus thinks the most important thing is knowing him, and that's why he came. That's why he died. So you could know God. Now we already are and already do, and that's our second point. How are we doing this, and how can we do this? We're already doing what matters most, and that, that needs to be heard. Moms need to, to hear this. Many moms' magazines. There's some beautiful things about them that remind them, you're already doing what matters most. You're loving your kids. Because a lot of moms beat themselves up, can think about the things that they haven't done. Oh, if only I got time for, for this, that, that would have been better. And then they look online and they see these other moms. And of course, I mean, moms on, online, you don't see all the, the, the horribly disgusting kitchen from everything that was kind of done preparing this beautiful thing that they want to put on, on social media. You just see the, the beauty that's put out there. And then moms wind up beating themselves up because why can't I do something like that? I mean, who, who knows? Who knows what their basement looks like? I don't know. But moms need to be reminded, you're, you're doing what matters most. You're doing it. You're loving those kids. And churches need to be reminded of that too. You're doing what matters most. Christians need to be reminded of that too. You're doing what matters most. You are knowing God. You're being known by God. That's what the, the previous vision statement talked about is consistently growing deeper in our faith. Again, the goal is just to kind of shorten the, the mission statement in a way that's memorizable, easy to say. So we're knowing, and we, okay, so we also believe in, in knowing God. That's why when a kid is baptized, we give a children's Bible. That's why when a person makes profession of faith, you give a study Bible. That's why we got Bible studies. That's why there, there's midweek meetings when there's Bible lessons. It's all aimed at knowing God. 
I mean, that's what GEMS leaders want for those girls. That's what cadet leaders want for those boys. That's what edge leaders want for the young people. I want you to know God. Because he can do for you what, what I wish I could do for you. That's why when churches call a pastor, it's called a minister of the word. Meaning the responsibility is to, to minister this to you, to say, remember God. That, that's what I need usually. Okay, Adam, remember God. Remember who's in charge of all this. Remember that he loves you. Remember that he's in charge of all things. This is why we study the Bible. Like we're studying Colossians in the morning, finishing of Jeremiah at night. We don't do it because it's just good to know more about Jeremiah. We do it because this is a way in which God opens himself up to us. Say, look at how I'm dealing with these people in chaos and everything's falling apart in their culture. Or in Colossians, look at how I'm dealing with these people who already have me, but for whatever reason are, aren't, aren't diving deeper into me. Why we read through the, the Old Testament. This is what Paul had to say about the whole Old Testament. Everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. So what's going on there is the reason you read the book of Ruth is not just to get the book of Ruth done or really just to know the story. It's to say, look how God cared for this widow who really had nothing going on in her direction in any humanly speaking way. She threw herself totally on God and he cared for her. So you can throw yourself totally on God too. Or you read the book of Ruth, you see a society totally in turmoil. That's the book of Judges. Horrible things happening. And how does God turn it around? Not by anybody's plan, but through this widow who falls in love with Boaz and they have a kid and that kid's son is David. That's how God does it. He just does what he's going to do. And that's why that book of Ruth is there to tell you. Or you read about David's life, discouragement after discouragement. And to say, this is a man after God's own heart, so if you face discouragement after discouragement, it doesn't mean God's cast you off. It's to remind you, this is the God I'm in relationship with. The God of David is, is my God. Now we want others to know this God. That's part of the original mission statements boldly going out with the good news of, of Jesus. This is just another way of saying, okay, we know it's good to know God. We want other people to know God too. There's plenty of people who don't know God. We had Mission Sunday a few months ago. So Sandy Poe was sending a message and a letter and Sean Bootsma and Stepping Forward and the Runias and Brent Coy. That's why we support Inspiration Hills. That's why we support the, the Union Gospel Mission. Support these because people need to know God and people in this community need to know God. Like imagine, that, imagine there was a number of families in Inwood that didn't have access to, to sewer or electricity and turning into fall and then winter didn't have any sort of ways of heating their homes. We'd be, we'd be rightly, rightly troubled by that. Well, there, there's plenty of people that don't know God. And that, that brings a whole lot more trouble. This is what Paul said to the Galatians. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were slaves to those who by nature are not gods. So what Paul's saying is something's going to be governing your life, and if it's not God, it's going to be something that's going to destroy you. I mean, you, you know your besetting sins. I know my besetting sins. You know how they can totally rip your life apart. And Paul's saying is knowing God is the, that's the only thing that's going to rescue you from that. And it's the only thing that's going to rescue these other people from that. I mean, the horrible things we humans do to each other, and we can do horrible things to each other, it's a deficiency of knowing God. This is what Paul said. We had this for our outdoor service. They did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a depraved mind so that they ought not to do, they ought not to do what ought not to be done. The best thing you can do for somebody is to get them to know God because that changes other things in their lives. Right? The best thing you can do it's to say, this is what God is like. You can trust Him. 
I mean, why, why deal with all the symptoms? Why not just deal with the root of the problem? Know God. And there's nothing better than knowing God. David says that you're going to fill me with presence, with eternal delight in your presence. I mean, that, that's what you want, right? You want eternal delight. You want to know that nothing's ever going to go off the rails again, and it's just going to get better and better and better. That, that's what I want. That's what you want. And what David says is, no God. This is what Habakkuk had to say about that same, same idea. The earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And this isn't to say everyone's just going to sit around and read books about God. It's to say that what the new creation is like is the knowledge of God is everywhere, meaning everything is as it should be and related to God. So all of life, intimacy, relationships, resources, everything is with a sense of gratitude to God and saying, isn't it great you set it up this way? I mean, maybe you've been to a museum or an amusement park. Let's just say an amusement park. We just drove by Valley Fair the other, other day on the way back from Minneapolis. Um, isn't it great they set it up this way? Isn't this wonderful? That, that's kind of what the new creation is. And that, that's, that knowledge, that's needed here. It's needed in Inwood. I mean, Inwood needs to be filled with uh, the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. That's what, that's what every church is to be about. That's what we're to be about. Knowing God. Making Him known. And that's what we got to offer. All right, the world can offer a lot and does offer a, a lot. I mean, thinking about medical technology, we should be incredibly thankful for that. Thinking about the advances in, okay, communications technology, who, who isn't thankful that you can now get in touch with somebody that you can't see, wouldn't see otherwise? But what the church has to offer is God. That's what we get to offer. And that's what people need. That's the good news always for the church is what people need is what we've got to offer. All right, it, it's kind of like people, I don't know, thinking about, thinking about OPEC. A whole lot of oil. Well, nations need oil. So OPEC has the sense of we're, we're doing okay because people need what we got. That's the church too. People need what we offer. They need God. They need him far more than they know. They need him far more than, than gas. But they often don't, don't know it. Just like left to yourself, you don't know it. And left to myself, I don't know it. So what's needed is for everyone to know God. You be still and you know that God's God. That, that's the main thing people need. That's what they needed before the pandemic began. That's what they're going to need in 2035, whatever that looks like. That's what you need. It's what you're always going to need the most. That's why the best thing about the new creation is the main thing is that you know God and there's nothing between you and Him. Let's go to Him in prayer. And Father, we ask that we might know You not just about You, that we would drive right to the hoop with You in times of frustration like Job, that we would just go right to You, that we would like your son, trust in you even when things look very bleak and dark as they did for your son. And in his story, we see it winds up very, very good for those who trust in God. Father, we ask that you, you might use us as a congregation to help others know you. That's hard. We think about how can we help somebody go from point A, which is not knowing you at all, to point B, which is loving you. And we scratch our heads, and that's because it's not ours to, to do. Your spirit does that. And the flesh availeth nothing. The spirit gives life. And you work through your people. You work through your word. Father, we ask that you'd work in Inwood. May people know you because we're here. Father, that would be a remarkable thing to hear on the final day. Somebody saying to us, I now know God and I'll know him forever and love him forever and be loved by him forever because you as a church existed. And that's what we want. 
We ask this in your son's name. Amen. I'm going to be read, reading this before we sing together. is from George Mueller. Um, this is talking about what he thinks is the most important thing for him of every day. And it's what we just studied. He said in his diary, According to my judgment, the most important point to be attended to is this. Above all things, see to it that your soul is happy in the Lord. Other things might press upon you. Even the Lord's work might seem very urgent. But I deliberately repeat, it's of supreme importance that you seek above all things to have your soul truly happy in God himself. Day by day, seek him. Make this the main business of your life. This has been my firm and settled conviction for the last 35 years. For the first four years after my conversion, I didn't know its vast importance. And after much experience, I commend this point of notice to, to the younger men and younger ladies in Christ. The secret of all true service to God is knowing him and making yourself happy in him, making that the main business of your life. That's what I want for, for you. It's what I want for me. I'm going to be praising God together, singing Knowing Him, or Knowing You, I'm sorry. After the parting blessing, we're just going to sing the final verse of Come Thou Fount. Parting blessing is number six. Um, what this is all about is God tells Moses to tell Aaron to put my name on all the people. Meaning essentially, okay, you kind of, if you got little kids, you write their name on their jacket. Say, write my name on all of them. And this is how he says to do it, with God's name. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. May he be very, very gracious unto you. And may the Lord smile upon you. May he give you peace. Amen. Amen.